Hey guys, it's Troy here with a question and answer video. A lot of you responded to the giveaway video that I had and I had suggested that maybe you ask some questions just so we can do another Q&A video for informational purposes for you um, and also, you know, material for me to be able to record. Um, I've got some other videos that are on the way, but quite honestly, I, I'm on vacation this week. So I've been spending a lot more time trying to relax, spend time with the family, getting ready to uh, do up in one of the rooms here, the, the boys' bedroom, gonna be painting that, did a few home repairs here, that kind of a thing. So I uh, hadn't been diving into doing pens as much this week as I had hoped. And quite honestly, I had taken this week off from work intending that the possibility we could go to the Miami Pen Show, which is gonna be going on probably about the time you're watching this and uh, didn't really work out that way. So, here we are, let's do some q and I'm gonna do it a little bit differently this time though. I'm gonna go ahead and just run through the questions and give answers, and instead of stopping to show you the pens and that kind of thing as I go, um, I will go ahead and I will add in clips a little later on. That'll make it a little easier on you and probably me, because I just want to get this initial uh, part done, and I can work on the rest as details later, as, uh, you know, in post-production kind of thing. So, let's get right to it. Jacob Roseberry. He asks, uh, what, in your opinion, is the best bang for your buck? whether it be a budget pen or high-end? Good question. I actually get asked that regularly uh, by different people. And here are my personal answers because they're, it's a little bit different for everybody. All right, uh, Different people have different opinions. I'm going to give you mine in mine alone. So let's get started with uh, my first answer. Uh, Waterman Phileas. I may be biased on that, but quite honestly, even though it was my first real fountain pen and the first one I ever wrote with, the quality for the for the money is unbeatable. And I used it for 20 years. Uh, and uh, I bought it for $40 in 1990s, uh, yeah, in the 90s somewhere. Uh, and it did fabulously well. I still use them today and I've got a bunch of them. And for the money, I have a hard time finding a better pen than that. The Faber-Castell Hexo is another one. Uh, Faber-Castell, the, you know, the, they've got the Loom and a few others, the Basic, but quite honestly, I think the Hexo was actually a pretty doggone good pen for the money when it came out. Uh, the ST DuPont Classique that I managed to pick up fairly decently on price, uh, fantastic writer. And for the quality, for the price, excellent. I've yet to use an ST DuPont that I didn't like, and I've got several in my collection. Uh, maybe uh, a vintage Esterbrook, if you can find it, with a broad nib. Those, to me, have been some really excellent pens for the money. If you're going to get into vintage, and I'll probably hit this question again later, because there, there are some questions concerning this, but a vintage Esterbrook is probably one of your best values that you can find uh, when you're looking at vintage pens because it's so versatile with all the different nibs that you can use with the renew points and the the, the cost is just uh, good cost so the, the per dollar spent is a good value Maria asks have you ever broken a pen while cleaning it while cleaning it no I have not I have broken pens trying to fix them and restore them. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've ruined a good many pens while trying to work on them, uh, trying to improve them, trying to restore them. Broken a bunch, but never in cleaning. One thing I did do in cleaning is um, I did lose um, a 1.1 stub nib down my drain. That, that was kind of a bummer that day. And it's only because the drain sat a little cocked in, in the drain plug. So, oh well. Uh, Frank Perez asks, Are there any new up-and-coming pen companies uh, that have caught your interest? Got to be honest, there aren't a tremendous amount of penny, uh, pen companies that I looked at and said, mm, I want to check them out. Narwhal, maybe. Um, I've got a, some narwhals in the house, two or three of them. Uh, those were the original series. And been kind of wanting to check some of their others as well, some of their newer models, but um, just their originals are all that I've really tried, and there's a few more that are out there. I think the Key West line, if uh, that sounds right, uh, wouldn't mind trying some more of their stuff. 
Traditional Larry asks, I would like to know what made you pick Waterman pens as your favorite? All right, uh, short answer, experience. Um, you know, Waterman was the first real fountain pen that I owned. It was a modern pen. I just answered that a little earlier, included that. But um, so I ended up picking up, when I started to look at vintage, some Schaefer, an Imperial, and then some Watermans. And the more I wrote with vintage Watermans in the history of them as I started to look at them, uh, the more I started to like them. And then modern pens uh, from Waterman, I've just had really good success uh, with some of their luxury pens. Student pens, they've been okay. You know, they've been good, reliable writers. Not necessarily my favorites, but I still use them. On my desk, I've got two. Two vintage Watermans are my daily writer desk pens sitting right here within arm's reach um, kind of thing. And it's just the quality. The Schaefer is a close second. I love a lot of vintage Schaefer. As a matter of fact, I've got a new Schaefer. I can't really say new. Vintage Schaefer on its way to me to add to my collection that I ordered just today. Um, let's see. Paca... Pakuche company. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Pakuchai. I, who has influenced... Who have you influenced the most with your love for pens? So, uh, so I guess the question is, who have I influenced the most? I have no idea. Um, I know people who have reached out to me and said that they have been uh, enjoying uh, the, the material that I've put out, that they've taken a lot of suggestions that I've had that's put them on a path. Um, I ask constantly uh, for advice from different people, so I would assume that I've had an influence on them. My son, definitely, Matthew. Um, matter of fact, Matthew has done a video with Larry and myself uh, in a Zoom call here just the other day. And I'll put a, I'll try to remember to put a link down below where Matthew just got a brand new fountain pen for his birthday from Larry at Larry's Fountain Pens. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll try to put that link up for you and you can see that. Um, now, is, as far as who has influenced me the most, if that's kind of your question, let's see. I have a friend of mine, he used to be my best friend, who passed away about seven years ago. He was the first one to ever let me touch and use a fountain pen, and he had a Waterman Phileas. And that's why I bought a Waterman Phileas, because he had one, and I wanted one for myself. Uh, so that kind of got me into the idea of using them, but beyond that, um, basically I've got a, I got some dealers, you know, and who, who actually reach out to me, Joe, man, you want some pens? <laughs> like I'm standing on a, in an alley kind of thing. So, yeah, they influence me too because I'm always buying stuff I shouldn't be buying. Uh, Z. Rosalex. I would like to ask you, what is your best vintage and modern pen that you currently have and what is your criteria for choosing them as the best? Okay, for vintage, um, I've got a couple of them. Um, I've got a vintage Waterman 67, which sits on my desk and is a desk pen. Fantastic pen. Great writing pen. Use it all the time. Reliable. I get it. I ink it up all the time because I make good use of it. Um, and a Waterman 58 is another good, big, chunky pen that writes extremely well. Uh, both of them have stiff nibs, by the way, manifold nibs, and they write very well. Um, surprisingly, too, um, an Arnold button filler. I don't know why, but I, I kind of gravitate towards and really like that Arnold button filler. Arnold was a third tier manufacturer out of Virginia. They were definitely not an upper tier uh, manufacturer, but they uh, kind of um, went after or modeled after uh, like Parker dual folds. And uh, this particular uh, button filler, it actually writes better than my dual fold. And I thought that was a fantastic value. I uh, really like that, and I pull that out every once in a great while. For modern pens, um, the Waterman Edson is one of my all-time favorites. The first time I saw one, I, I fell in love with the uh, the style, the 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 design of the nib is just fantastic. I uh, really really enjoy that, um, and also a Conway Stewart Churchill. Uh, that is another one that when I purchased it, 
uh, I had I've been ogling them at Penton shows and online, and I just found a really good deal on one, so I went ahead and got it. Um, it just wrote very very well. The thing is for me, they fit well in my hand. I kind of like oversized pens to begin with, so I like them that they're a good girth. I like that they are smooth. I don't like fine or scratchy nibs. Not a fine nib guy at all. So if they've got a medium to a broad nib and they write buttery smooth. I'm not hard to please. When I was asked by a custom pen maker what I wanted in a nib, I said I like boring nibs. I like a good buttery smooth medium nib. Period. It doesn't have to be springy. It doesn't have to be flex. It doesn't have to be anything special. No special grind. I just want a good boring medium buttery smooth nib and a pen is no good to me if the nib sucks so if it's uh, got a good writing smooth nib and all the ones I just mentioned fantastic writing pens um, one that surprised me this one sits on my desk as of right now and it is a, uh, a 1974 Pilot Mew MYU uh, 701 and this is another one of those buttery smooth pens where the nib is actually part of the section so um, a lot narrower than I like it's a lot thinner than I, per I particularly care for however it writes very very well so for me I place that up higher even though it's not my style of pen the design of it was fantastic so I said I want one of those it just happens to be on my desk because I've been using it uh, ever since I got it kind of thing so my criteria quality and the writing experience whether they're steel nibs gold nibs whatever it's the writing experience and reliability for me Daniel Solmarie, why do vintage lever fillers have holes in the cap, yet more modern pens seem to try to have caps that seal the nib? Good question. What I was told, and from what I have read, the, the holes in the modern caps were for um, air balance or air flow so that you don't get a suction when you go to take it off and therefore draw ink out of a sack kind of thing so I'm told um, and especially with um, maybe with uh, uh, eyedroppers that kind of thing I was told it was um, an air pressure um, device or air pressure measure um, and the modern pens because they're they tend to be cartridge um, or converter fed uh, they just want to try to keep that pen sealed so as to keep the the moisture um, or the wetness to it that's what I'm told and I and I may be wrong but that's my understanding fountain pen inker asks this how do you mostly use your fountain pens while working somehow at home or a culmination of both ways alright for me where I sit right now recording this very video is where I work for about 20 years I've been working from home um, I have a very technical oriented job and as long as I have good computer connectivity um, I can perform my engineering duties just fine because my traveling from site to site days are over for the most part with the technology changes so I work here so using at home for me is using at work so um, even though everything I do is pretty much digital um, I still have notebooks and notepads um, I still do a lot of letter writing. I still keep a checkbook in analog form. Um, and I still write a lot of notes for work, to do lists, um, and checklists, and that kind of thing. Print out spreadsheets and cross them off rather than necessarily going on a computer to do them sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's easier for me to follow in how I can tend to do things. So, Friedrich D., thanks for showing that new Waterman gentleman. Would you say it's one of the most slender models of Watermans you own? No, it's fairly average uh, for a modern waterman, uh, and I've got some that are a lot more slender than that. Is uh, I would like to hear your personal thoughts on what direction you would like to see the hobby head in, in general. Here's what I would like to see. 
if a brand is going to revitalize a name um, or an old model, I would like to see them actually exactly reproduce the original. Uh, I would love for that to happen and at a comparable price point when you factor in inflation. That would be awesome. I would love to see more companies make their own nibs rather than always getting Bakker Yovo, Bakker Yovo, Bakker Yovo. And that's pretty much it for um, major companies that take other manufactured nibs in their own pens. Um, small time makers and custom makers, I understand, they're not going to be able to make their own. It's, uh, it's going to be quite an investment in order to make that happen and it will not be cheap for them to do so. I get that. But for large manufacturers, I would like to see, I would love to see them start to um, go back to the old ways. If you're going to produce a gold nib, it's hard to beat some of these vintage nibs from the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and I would love to see us return to some of that manufacturing. I mean, gold is gold. I would just like us to return to that. I would love to see what Esterbrook did. Uh, very innovative uh, with uh, Esterbrook in uh, the United States in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, when they had the Renew Point system where you could put in dozens and dozens of different kinds of nibs, pick what you wanted and be able to unscrew it out the old, screw it in. I would love for that to be available widely. I would love for International Standard International to be actually the standard. Uh, I would. I understand proprietary companies are not going to let go of their proprietary cartridges and converters because it's another revenue stream for them. But um, I would love to see standardized stuff like that. Um, you know, cell phones. Uh, you see where more and more companies are going to like USB-C, uh, or uh, they were using micro USB, that kind of thing, and it eventually got to where they were more standardized in what they were taking. So I'd love to see that kind of thing happen in the pen. Uh, world as well. Uh, Nicole writes and says, I'm from the Philippines, currently just getting into the fountain pen hobby. Very good. Um, what are the vintage pocket pens you have collected and can you compare them with the modern ones that are sold today? I will actually do um, an edit here and inset a video that I'm going to record on that very topic now. Roll that beautiful bean footage. All right, so I was asked about pocket pens, and in particular, vintage ones. So I've laid some out here in front of you to, to show you the uh, the different sizes and the variety of pocket pens, and then compared to some more of the modern uh, pocket pens that are over here. And uh, what you're going to find is most of these were you know third party um, or third tier manufacturers. Uh, some of them that weren't real big time, uh, but you're going to find little ones like this right here which I thought was kind of cute I went ahead and ordered it um, and uh, you know it's it's tiny it's cute it's adorable uh, so I figured you know for for the amount of money that I was able to spend on some of these little ones uh, I would just go ahead and get them and you can see how small they are in my hand uh, generally you're not going to find a lot of pocket pens that are this size that were manufactured by you know, the, the big name retailers or the big uh, manufacturers rather but uh, you know I picked these up over time uh, whether they were through auctions where I got multiple pens at once or even uh, found some of these fairly inexpensively one at a time but I went ahead and just decided you know, all right, let's see what the deal is. Um, you know, little tiny ones like this. I mean, it is so small in the hand. And they do actually write. You know, like this one, I think was, uh, this was a Bantam, um, I think was the, the model kind of thing. But, you know, they all function. This is a bub bulb filler on this particular one, if I remember correctly, where it actually has a, like a, a sack on the end that you would squeeze in order to go ahead and fill it whereas the others were lever filler with a sack on the inside kind of thing so but you do have some they're not really pocket but they're they're vest size pens uh, and usually end up with the the V at the end of like a Waterman like a Waterman 3 V and they are meant to be vest size so let's say if you're wearing a three-piece suit um, you would actually put this inside your vest 
uh, if uh, you were a gentleman and you were in business kind of thing. You could actually have some smaller pens, uh, but still get the Waterman quality, uh, and you wanted to have a pen available for you like that. All right, so let's compare some of these to more modern pens. When you start looking at like the Stipula Passaporto, the Caveco Sport, uh, some Oto, uh, these two are Oto brand and then this one here is my favorite pocket pen of them all uh, which is a Pilot Mu 701 and it's one of my newer editions fantastic pen so um, there you go um, you know these uh, and somebody else had asked about the the, the most functional um, the smallest functional pen that I own well you're looking at them right here this one this one this one this one these are the smallest uh, functional fountain pens uh, that are in my collection. Sean Thomas asks, what is your favorite Moon Man pen? All right, for Moon Man, I've got the M2, the C1, the Q1, and the M600. I would say out of that, my favorite's the M600 because that's where Moon Man started to make nicer pens, um, a little more quality. Don't get me wrong, I like the M2. The M2 is a great pen, especially if you can get it in a medium nib or a 1.1 stub, and those were available at one time, and that's what I bought. Um, great pen, huge ink capacity. Uh, the Q1, I just recently did a video on that. The Q1 is a neat novelty. It's kind of fun to play with, fun to write with, um, but it's not going to be an everyday writer for me, but it's cool to have around. The C1 is uh, is a pretty decent, all-around average pen, but I think the M600 so far has been my favorite Moon Man uh, that I've had. Cliff asks, how many pens do you own and how do you store them? Well, pen, uh, work, Cliff, I'm looking at my pen um, spreadsheet right here on my computer and documented in my spreadsheet. I have 461 of them. Um, that's not all that I own. I actually have more than that. Some need repair, some need restoration. I've got pens for giveaway. Um, but out of my personal collection that I have documented and can rotate in and out of my uh, collection, 461. And I've got several more on the way. Um, how do I store them? Well, I have... Um, you know, I, I tried different things. When it was a small collection, I had a nice little tiny zippered uh, pouch, and then I got a bigger uh, pouch, and then I went with these storage um, containers or drawers that sit here right behind me, and I'm putting up some pictures of that right now, and uh, maybe a little bit of video, and I'll show you how I open up the drawers, and that's how I've been storing my pens for a while, and then when they start to get full, I just order another one, and I stack them. So I've got a bunch of them, some from uh, drawers, um, a three drawer with one of the drawers being deeper for my oversized pens that won't fit in the four drawer cabinets. Um, but um, this is how I've been storing all my uh, pens for long term storage. It sits right behind my desk and all I gotta do is swivel my chair around and go through that. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Okay, so here's my storage. Here's how I handle my storage ink samples. Uh, I got a whole lot of ink up here, bottles of ink, um, but I keep my ink samples there, and this is where I store the pens. I've got uh, several different sets of drawers, artist drawers, um, and uh, what I do is I tend to group them according to brand, if at all possible. And sometimes, uh, just like miscellaneous, like miscellaneous modern pens, since there's not enough of those to, to make their own. Uh, I've got one little thing for roller balls, and I try to keep them organized somewhat. And you see that I keep all my ones that are inked together here in one drawer, for instance. All the ones that I know that I have inked up right now and ready to go are there. And usually all my oversized ones that are inked are there. But I try to keep all... Uh, all my pens together, organized in these little drawers like this. I'll uh, just look at, throw a few more drawers out. Some, some of the gin house. Um, all the pens that end up needing to be cleaned, I put in a little container like this because I've got uh, mine, my son's, my wife's pens. Whenever they run dry, whenever we run them out of ink, 
uh, then we go ahead and store them in here until I do a great big cleaning. Uh, but I'll just look at some of uh, the oversized ones or in a, in a deeper drawer like that. Um, somebody had asked about pocket pens, pocket size pens, a bunch of Watermans, vintage Watermans, modern Watermans. I've probably got more drawers labeled Waterman than any other. But this is how I keep my pens. Vintage, all different brands of uh, vintage, stored like that. So there you go. That's what I do. All right, so let's go look at the next question. Kazaya Santos. I don't know if I pronounced that right. If not, I apologize. Uh, but uh, Kazaya asks, I'd love to see your cheapest yet quality pens that you currently have and tell us more about it. All right, I'll do that in another separate little video right now. Roll that beautiful bean footage. All right, cheapest and yet quality. You know, you got to have both of those qualifiers on here in order to qualify for this list. So uh, this is what I'm going with. Um, these are just some of them that, that come to mind. There are others, uh, but quite honestly, these are some of the ones that, um, as I'm going through my collection and my list, that popped into my mind as, you know, these were actually decent ones. Probably the most underrated fountain pen anywhere is the Platinum Preppy, especially if you can get it in a medium nib. They write so much better than the, the fine nibs that they tend to come with. I actually like the Preppy an awful lot, um, and I what I did for, at one time is um, I I droppered one of these uh, in a Bay State Blue, <laughs> so you know the dreaded Bay State Blue from um, uh, from Noodlers Inc. Well, you know what, I droppering a Platinum Preppy in one of those makes an awesome regular writer. Uh, here's one that you don't see a whole lot of. This is a Platinum. It's kind of a desk pen, but it is a carbon ink pen. Um, and uh, this, I will go ahead and take that off for you and show you. It's just a cartridge converter uh, pen, and it happens to have carbon black in it. And you pull it off, and it acts like a desk pen, but it does cap rather than sitting in to a, um, into a desk set. And actually, you can buy a desk set that is made just for this, or you can put it into any old vintage uh, desk set that you've got. But I keep it capped. And this has been capped like a year and it still writes, uh, surprisingly so, and it does very well, and that's uh, fairly inexpensive too. I think that was like $15 or so. Uh, the Moon Man, you probably have seen this as well. I mentioned it earlier, the M2. Um, out of the Moon Men pens on the lower end, an eyedropper, and for the quality that you can get with it, especially if you can get the medium uh, and the 1.1 stub, actually write fairly well. The Nemesine Singularity is one that uh, is, you either love them or you hate them. I tend to like them. Uh, Nemesine has gone out of business, unfortunately, but you can, you may be able to still find these out there, but it's a decent pen, low cost pen, and for me, it's actually been fairly good. I, I've had no complaints. We've had several of them in our family. Here's another one, the Knox Play-Doh, and this is a good heavy pen. It actually writes very well, and I've given some of these away, uh, but um, it's a big, chunky, and it's a, a good, hefty pen if you can find them uh, by Knox. And uh, as I understand, it's a German-made pen. The Jinhao 911, which is another one I've, I'm going to be mentioning in this video as well. Uh, the 911 was one of those that was a fairly decent quality, and it's a hooded nib. And mine, rather than some of them, uh, I know that have had, instead of having um, a twist converter or a piston converter, uh, some have had a squeeze converter that other people have had. So uh, this was actually probably one of the better Jinhao purchases that I've made over the years. And the Faber-Castell Hexo was their lowest end, uh, as I recall. Um, but quite honestly, the Hexo, for the money and the performance on it, was actually a very good purchase and actually a great starter pen. I got this in a, in a medium nib. So um, those would be uh, just some that were on my lowest cost and yet quality pens uh, that I've got. All right, my friend Dan Roseberry asks the following. Dan and I uh, have been pen pals uh, and 
we keep in touch uh, through writing and uh, sometimes even through messaging. So Dan asks, I was wondering how you would coach us on what kind of pen is safe for pocket carry. Dan, good question. I gotta be honest with you, um, anything except what I have found in my personal experience, uh, vintage eyedroppers. My Waterman 12s are a great example. Great pen to have on my desk to write with and to use. Putting it in my pocket, not so much. <laughs> because you, you pull off the cap and you're inked everywhere. Uh, but I've carried just about everything except obviously my desk pens because those sit in a holder on my desk because they don't have a cap. Um, but um, I have used just about everything in my collection um, that is my, becomes a daily writer or my pen of the day. I've been carrying those pocket carry. I will put them into um, either a double uh, pen pouch, which I have somewhere here on my desk, or a single pen pouch, and throw it in my pocket. And along with that, if I'm using my double pen pouch, I've always got one in there for giveaway. So I always have two in that, give one away, and then when that one's given away, restock it with another one. Um, and of course, my pen of the day, my carry pen, would rotate in the other uh, pocket there. But I've had no problem, for the most part, carrying just about any pen. I did have one problem pen. Um, it was actually a pen that I got from a custom maker, but the converter that came with it because of a design flaw or some some horrible tolerance um, in the converter from the company that he was buying from, it leaked all over the place. Um, and that was easily fixed by replacing it with a good quality uh, converter. So I haven't had that problem since then. So there you go. Yang Yu asks, Troy, what's your recommendation for the best beginner fountain pen? And he names off like Lamy Safari, Pilot Metropolitan, Twisby Eco, and, and the like. Good question. Um, I've been asked that before, and I do have a video on this channel about the best fountain pens for under $25. Um, and uh, you can go check out that video. I'll try to remember to put a link in the description of the video or um, and so you can go see that as well. But here's my list um, that would be the best beginner fountain pens. And I'm not talking about ones that I would necessarily give away. Because I've actually given away Pilot Metropolitan's Lamy Safaris. Um, but um, And I pick those up when they're cheap or when I can get a good deal on them or when it's for a charity auction, I'll pick them up kind of thing and I'll have them and I'll end up giving them to somebody but um, I also have a bunch of pens like some Waterman student pens and Jinhao 992's and 599's that I've had over the years I've just given away those are not however necessarily the best beginner fountain pens they just happen to be ones that are inexpensive and enabled me to give them because of the price point on those so I'll give you my short list Twisby Eco uh, that you mentioned definitely on that list uh, it was a decent quality pen for the price. Uh, the Faber Castell Hexo, which is one that I mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier also the Waterman Phileas is I would never hesitate to buy another Waterman Phileas, especially in a good medium, broad, or stub nib. Uh, in the Schaefer Pop, uh, believe it or not, a twenty dollars Schaefer Pop, not a bad value for twenty bucks, especially when you get like Star Wars characters on them. Kind of a Star Wars geek of sorts. So there, there's my list on that. Tom asks, I was wondering if you take your pens on planes, as I've heard horror stories of pens leaking into the shirt pockets and ruining it. I typically don't fly. Um, the last time I flew was over two years ago, almost three years ago now. Uh, and that was the first time I had flown since 9-11. I remember flying back in 1999 to go to a cousin's wedding. And then I didn't fly again until like 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. Uh, it, yeah, I literally drive most everywhere I need to go, even if it's a long distance. Uh, it's just personal preference and the fact that I typically don't go places I can't get to by car um, and like the flexibility of not getting a rental car and obviously when I'm traveling with my family 
I've got the whole family, and I don't feel like paying for, you know, five plane tickets somewhere and getting a rental car. So, uh, I personally, you know, when I flew, I took my pens in a pouch, uh, a pen case, uh, and was not worried about them. Um, I think mostly vintage pens uh, have been a problem, especially, um, like I mentioned before, about pocket carry, uh, maybe with some old um, eyedroppers, that kind of thing. But, um, and, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't have a pen in my pocket, uh, shirt, especially in my shirt pocket, if I was flying. Um, to be honest with you, too, if I'm traveling and flying, um, I'm going to be wearing like shorts and a t-shirt or sweatpants or something, and I'm not going to be wearing a suit. Uh, because there's usually nowhere I go that for business, when I have traveled for business, and the last time I flew was actually for business, that I had to be dressed up uh, because of the kind of job that I do. I'm not an executive, I'm more of a techie uh, and um, behind the scenes kind of guy, and I very rarely interface with anybody but team members, um, and I'm not being seen by the public all the time, which is one of the reasons, like you see me right here, I'm, I'm not clean shaven at the moment. Uh, I only shave a couple times a week. <laughs> That's personal preference as well. I don't like a bloodbath um, because usually I'm sitting here at my desk and on my computer. Um, so I don't often, you know, dress up or shave. Heck, I don't even dress up for church. I will shave to, <laughs> before going to a church service, but uh, we've chosen a, a more casual dress a congregation that we go to so um, and I always carry a pen with me uh, there I realize I'm not talking about you know flying uh, right now but but it kind of dovetails with it that yeah I've got some suits but I almost never wear them funerals weddings yeah I wear them for those and um, if elected town council uh, here in my town I will most likely be wearing those a little more often kind of thing uh, because it's a little more formal kind of thing so but yeah I just flying not so much it's just a personal preference um, and I don't like the expense of it usually although flying sometimes is cheaper than taking Amtrak and the Amtrak station is one mile down the road from here and sometimes when I'm recording videos you can hear trains you now because I'm like one block from the railroad tracks and uh, this, this is known as train town uh, the town that I live in. A lot of trains come through here. All right. Um, aside or Aside, I, I be honest with you, if I'm butchering your name, I'm so sorry. Uh, Wefa, W E F A. Um, did you ever thought of introducing fountain pens to your child? Okay. Uh, you you must be a new subscriber uh, if if you're a subscriber and. Um, my son Matthew is a fountain pen enthusiast as well. He just turned 12, and I mentioned about uh, him and Larry, uh, Larry's Fountain Pens channel. Um, and Matthew is one of the only ones that have, has really taken an interest in fountain pens. Um, I, my youngest son Benjamin, um, he has one. He's lost it. He doesn't know where it is. Um, so. Yeah, so much for buying him a nice pen and then him losing it. Uh, but yeah, so all three of my sons have been exposed to it, uh, are exposed to fountain pens. My oldest couldn't care less. He has like zero interest. And there's a there's several reasons for that that I'm not going to get into uh, right now. Um, but um, he has zero interest in pens. My middle child, Matthew, uh, he is a fountain pen enthusiast, and he owns like 92 of his own in his own collection. And uh, my youngest has like one, one or two, maybe three. Uh, and the nicest one I bought him, he can't even find. So, oh yeah, I've I've certainly and, and my and my son Matthew has done some videos with me here on this channel, so you can uh, look back and see uh, him as he's grown older. Uh, let's see. Do you have a pen in your collection that did not meet your expectations? Asks Chris Graham. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've got a bunch of them that I was very disappointed in. Uh, some vintage pens that I went, you know, I don't know what the big hype was about that. Uh, but more modern pens, absolutely. I have ranted about Conklin and Monteverde from Yaffa Brands. And 
they seem to have remedied a lot of that with the change of nib manufacturer Yovo um, but uh, their previous pens have had quality control issues for a long time um, and I ran across problems with Monteverde and Conklin models and so have other people other pen guys here on YouTube have said the same thing and uh, very very disappointed other pens, uh, the Sailor 1911, I kept hearing great big things about it and got one. I'm like, eh, I don't see the big deal. I mean, it's okay. Platinum 3776, same way. Wrote with it, I'm like, eh, I don't see what the big hype was about it. I may still get another one in a very different nib just to see if that really changes things. Um, Pelican Jazz Elegance was one that I got and I was extremely disappointed with and I said that sucks um, Twisby Go that's an unpopular opinion of mine uh, oh boy I heard a lot of uh, hate I got a lot of hate mail about that a question from Kawaii Photography what would you recommend for starter vintage pens ah starter vintage I don't recommend the way I did it where I just ordered one off from eBay got it and it's like oh this sucks um, <laughs> And I learned, and from that though, I learned how to fix a vintage lever filler, um, and I learned what I couldn't fix and what I could fix on them, and played with over and over and over again, replaced the sack numerous times until I learned how to do it. But um, if I was to cut my teeth on vintage pens, my recommendation are, are several fold. Number one, I mentioned earlier, Esther Brooks. Esther Brooks are a great starter pen. They're they're inexpensive. They're plentiful, nibs are plentiful. It's easy to learn how to change an ink sack if you need to and to work on it. If you don't like the nib, there's plenty of other ones out there to swap it with and they're easy to swap. They're easy to clean if you know how to use them and do that correctly. And then, you know, hit me up, I'll, I'll teach you. Um, Arnold, I mentioned a little earlier about an Arnold button filler. Um, Arnold was a third tier manufacturer that ab actually made a good quality pen, in my opinion. Uh, let's see. Skylines. Eversharp Skylines. One of my all time favorite vintage pens. Absolutely love them. Some people would say uh, maybe a Waterman 52. And that's okay if you wanted to get into a Waterman 52. Personally, with knowing what I know, I'd, I'd go for the Waterman 55 uh, and step up to the number 5 nib on that, especially in a good manifold nib. Um, third tier manufacturers, or you know, some of these were actually made by primary manufacturers for other companies like Rexall. Rexall Drugs um, actually marketed some pens that w was sold under their name. Uh, decent quality, good service is another one that was, like I think, for Sears and Roebuck uh, that they had sold that were manufactured by other companies that were actually decent quality. So I would look into some of those um, as decent starters. And just keep in mind, if you're going to get into vintage pens, Understand, unless you're going to buy one that has been restored, then you are going to have to learn how to restore them. If you get just a cheap pen and you don't know where to start but you're on an extreme budget and you get a pen that needs restoration and you don't have the budget for it to buy all the materials you need to learn how to do it and you don't know how, so you're going to have to spend some time learning what you need to do in order to restore it and take the time and to learn how to do it and be prepared to fail and be prepared to break it when you start tinkering with them I don't recommend you jumping into vintage pens unless you buy them restored just my advice spend the extra money however if you're looking at the low-end stuff that you can get and you are buying for the purpose of learning how to fix them out of curiosity and um, you know just for personal knowledge, jump. Jump in, but be prepared uh, that you will have to fix some stuff uh, if you want to use them and you buy them unrestored. So that's my advice on that. Uh, Cosmic Vibration asks, what do you consider to be the holy grail of all pens that you have? All right, um, I've got some that are hard to come by nowadays. Um, and so as, in terms of being a collector, the Waterman 20 is one that I've got. Huge nib. Number 10 nib is just ginormous. 
and they're not cheap. The Waterman Edson in the Boucheron, to me, was my grail pen. I actually did a video on it, and I'll try to remember to put a, a link to that video uh, of my grail pen delivery. Um, also, close to that, I got a Waterman 58, which is not necessarily a grail pen, but I got a really good selection of pens that came to me all within a close amount of time, but for me, um, the Waterman Edson Boucheron was for me um, in terms of the collectability and the level of pen and it was one that I had shot for and I got. Now, here's what I'll tell you. It doesn't have as good a nib as my Sapphire Edson. Um, I think my Sapphire much less expensive Edson writes better than the Boucheron. But the Boucheron, to me, being a limited edition, being absolutely beautiful, um, and at the price point and collectability, that is probably one that's right at the top of my list, and that's just my personal. I've got some nice expensive pens sitting here too, but those are probably, in my opinion, some of my favorites and uh, that I had wanted. Frank Lee asks, what is the best and cheapest fountain pen you have encountered and what did it cost? You know, Frank, I was looking over my list and, um, you know, my, my spreadsheet that I mentioned a little earlier. And I was going down that list and I've actually got some good pens. Collecting pens doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, I've got a couple that I paid 99 cents for that were okay. Um, I'll be honest with you, I've got like an Ahow. I paid 99 cents for it and the one I got for my son and my mother-in-law and my wife wrote better than the one that I had personally. And the one I had personally needed some work. Um, so, a little disappointed in that, although it wrote great on some others. Probably, though, if you're looking at the cheapest fountain pen I've encountered, that was probably the best in terms of the price. Uh, Jinhao 911 for two dollars. It was like two bucks or less, um, and that was actually a really good deal, I think, for two dollars, and it wrote well. The Jinhao 911. Um, surprisingly and it's not one that I would necessarily recommend to everybody because I've got much better pens than that but in terms of lowest cost best performing for that cost probably the the Jinhao 911 all right so let's look at uh, the next question that comes along uh, let's see Joe um, Shafir Joe, if I got your name wrong, I'm sorry, but I know you, you've uh, we've actually had contact here. Have you ever written with a vintage Waterman pink? Okay, I'm assuming you mean like a Waterman 7 vintage with a pink nib. I'm assuming that's your question. Um, have I ever written with the pink nib? No, I have not. I've used several Waterman 7s and 7 nibs, but not necessarily the pink nib. Um, so I haven't had that opportunity. Sorry, bud. Um, but Waterman had a in the number seven had a bunch of different nibs that were laid out um, in by color. Waterman had a, a color scheme, and I'll try to put up a graphic of that here. All right, let's go ahead and make this the last one for this particular video. Um, I mean, I've got more questions that I could keep going on uh, from that were previously submitted, but let's go ahead and make this one the last one just to wrap it up. As a newer fountain pen enthusiast and collector, I would love to know what were your first pen purchases have been. What would what would have my my first pen purchase have been? I, I kind of covered that a little bit, but I got to be honest with you, I don't think I would have changed anything in terms of um, me having, uh, you know, the very first, the very first fountain pen I ever got was a no name green cartridge pen. I still have it here in my collection. Uh, it ran out of ink, and I couldn't find cartridges in any of the major stores, so I just chucked it into a, a, a shoebox full of uh, pens. Um, and 20-some years later, I pulled it out, cleaned it up, and was able to write with it. So I still have that. Uh, but the second pen I ever bought, because I was looking for something a little better, uh, was that Waterman. Phileas. I would not have changed that at all. That was an excellent starter pen for me. And it ate any ink I put into it, wrote on just about anything with the exception of like greeting cards. And um, you know, when I was dating my wife, um, she dug out not too long ago uh, a card that I had given her while we were dating. And uh, we were talking about the pen hobby and how I would gotten into that after we were married. 
and I mean just really got into it. I was already a fountain pen user, but I only had essentially that one. Um, and uh, that's where she had said, you know, look at this. It even says here that you had written that said my fountain pen doesn't seem to like this card very much. So, um, but I wouldn't have changed that at all. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy with the way I started into that. Um, let's see. What are your favorite pen, nib, and ink combinations? Um, I'd mentioned a lot of my favorites here. Um, my Waterman 67 with a uh, the number seven rigid nib. Love it. And I put into that because, oh, I'll just go ahead and show you since it's right here. Uh, it is a blue ripple, blue and olive ripple. Um, I put into a uh, Waterman Serenity Blue. So this pen with a rigid number seven nib um, that sits on my desk in a little pen holder with Waterman Serenity Blue is my go-to. Um, and also when I want to use a finer line or I uh, want to write with black, Waterman 100 year desk pen and I put a Waterman Black into that. So those are my go-to's um, that sit here all the time. Uh, and in terms of paper, I am not um, a paper snob. I have written letters on ordinary notebook paper. I've got notepads back here. I've written on stuff. I mean, I've got, sure, I, I've invested a little bit into stuff like Tomaway River. Um, I've got some Clairefontaine. I've got Rhodia. Um, I've got um, a few others. Um, Ayush. I'm not a paper snob. I've tried different papers. I also use just plain old ordinary notepads um, that I would get at my local um, office supply store. Um, those work for me just fine. I use that in the course of the day. Um, I write on copy paper that I use in my uh, printers all the time. So, um, and so in terms of paper and, and preferences, I don't have some real big paper preferences. Uh, have you ever had exactly what you wanted in, in a, in a, I'm a yes, um, in a pen? Yes. Um, some of the pens that I mentioned are some of my top pens. Absolutely, that Waterman 67, I was looking for an excellent desk pen. I've tried a bunch, a dozen different desk pens. said, I want a really good desk pen that will be my permanent desk pen, and I found it in that Waterman 67 I just showed you. Um, that was, to me, probably the perfect desk pen for me. Um, I showed you that Pilot Mew 701. That was an excellent pen. It was exactly what I wanted. It performed exactly the way I wanted it to. Um, you know, the Excalibur that I showed you earlier or talked about earlier, that was one of them. The Waterman Edson, exactly what I wanted. ST DuPonts have been exactly what I wanted to for them to be good quality pens uh, that are very reliable and right buttery smooth. So, yeah, I've, I've, definitely gotten some. And last question, do you think that HP Inkjet Paper Premium 32 is a good paper to write on? If I don't have something like Rodier or Clairefontaine or some others. I, I, again, I'm not a paper snob and I quite, quite honestly, I don't know about um, HP LaserJet uh, or Inkjet Paper. I've had Inkjet specific for Inkjets before and I've not written on them with fountain pens. I've written on cheap staples um, copy paper, which I tend to use in my uh, printers. I've got an inkjet and I have a laser uh, printer, both sitting right here in my office. You know, a laser printer, an HP laser that prints just black and white. And then I've got like a brother all-in-one scanner printer that does color. And, um, you know, I, I use ordinary copy paper in them both. And uh, so in terms of the HP inkjet paper, I haven't experienced that exact paper before, so I can't answer your question there. But um, you know, I've got notepads, notebooks, I've got cheap stuff that I've bought from Walmart or Target that do fairly well as well. And I've got stuff at the dollar store. To be honest with you, Dollar Tree had some really good fountain pen friendly paper for a buck. Uh, that I've bought over the years. And uh, it, it actually almost feels like the Ayush paper uh, which is Indian manufactured. This paper, I don't even know what it was because there was no branding on it. Um, I got a, um, 
uh, from my company. I've got you know a, a portfolio, one of those fold zip up portfolios, where a notepad came in that that was a fairly thick paper, and I used that to write um, a note to somebody just yesterday and put it in the mail, kind of thing. And those write fine too. So. I'm not a paper snob, you know. I, for a long time, I wrote letters on ordinary note paper because I just didn't feel like paying for Rhodia or, and I've got a bunch of Rhodia actually you know, right behind me up here. I've got uh, a bunch of nice expensive paper up there, um, but you know, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. It all depends upon my mood. So, anyway, a uh, couple of things coming up. Uh, number one, T-shirts. You know what? If you uh, have been thinking about maybe wanting a t-shirt, I have. These t-shirts are available for sale, fountainpenfanatic.com. There's a link down below in the video description. You can go get your own, help spread the word, and wear some pretty cool swag. Um, I've got some. Uh, I've got at least three of my own. My boy has some. I just ordered a bunch. Some of my friends have gotten some here recently. Check it out there. Uh, discount codes. I've told you about discount codes, antiquedigger.com. I just took advantage of my own discount code today, and I've got another pen on the way from Antique Digger. Uh, let's see, what else? I have some giveaways still on the way. Um, I have some pens that I'm going to give away. I thought about giving away some of these t-shirts. Um, if you watch that video that Larry did on Zoom with my son Matthew and me, and you see what Matthew got for his birthday from Larry? Guess what? I have one just like it and have for quite some time for this express purpose of giveaway. So, at my, neat, my next uh, subscriber threshold, I will go ahead and, and give away one of those. And if you watch that video from Larry, you know what kind of pen it is and you're going to want to participate in that giveaway. Um, I have coming another pen that uh, I'm thinking about just giving away, um, and it is an antique Waterman. So look forward to that. I've got another pen actually sitting right here behind me that needs to be restored, which is another antique lever filler Waterman. I bought that so that I could restore it and sell it or give it away. I'm kind of leaning towards giving it away. That could be you. So other than that, hey, spread the word about the channel. Keep uh, keep telling your friends, family about it. Share these videos. Click like, subscribe, comment, and keep the subscribers going. Um, and the more subscribers we get, the more giveaways I'm going to have. Uh, and I just truly appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to reach out to me. I do my best, and I'm not always a flawless in it, but I do my best to try to get back to you, answer questions. That's one of the reasons we do a Q&A, and oftentimes social media people hit me up all the time um, outside of YouTube, believe it or not. And the link where you can find me on social media is down in the video description below. Other than that, thanks for watching, guys. I, I really appreciate it. I've got some fantastic uh, viewers. Um, and I've been really interested in finding that so many of you are from out of the country. Um, I've been giving away pens for a, a long, long time. And I've been shipping pens as giveaways to Israel, uh, to Australia, a lot to Canada, to the Philippines, um, South America. So it, it baffles me how people from all over the world will watch a schmo like me uh, sit here and ramble on in front of a camcorder uh, in, in his messy office. So thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you la uh, later on, on the next video. I've got some more planned, and they're coming.